morning, everyone, and welcome to the Lift Church. Go ahead and hop up on your feet. Let's enter into worship. Isn't he good? Isn't he worthy? Thank you, Jesus, for your overflow this morning. Hallelujah. Sing this with us. In your freedom now, I'm covered by your grace. Witness in your healing power, you say we have been changed. Bless the Lord.
I love that the opening line of this chorus says, then sings my soul. Because down at the core of my being, the core of who I am, knows despite my circumstance, he's great. Despite the storm clouds, he's great. So if I'm standing on the mountain, my soul will sing of his greatness because in the core of my being, I know who he is. But if I find myself down in the lowest valley, still the song ringing from my soul is how great is this king of glory. I don't know what you're facing, but I wonder if there's any worshipers in the room this morning that knows in the core of your being that there is none like None beside him. If there are, won't you lift your voice right now? Fill the atmosphere. Let it be known. There is none greater, none higher, none holier. Then sings my soul. Sing it out.
Lord, here in this atmosphere that's charged with faith, as a body, we take a moment and we just declare the greatness of the name of Jesus. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that he and he alone is Lord. We declare that over depression today. We declare that over anxiety today. We declare that over heaviness today. We declare it over sickness and disease and marriages that are in turmoil. No matter what the obstacle is in front of the people gathered in this room and joining us online, we declare there is a name that's greater than every challenge, every enemy, every obstacle. Can we one more time lift up a mighty shout to the name of Jesus? Come on. Shout the shout of victory. You're worthy, Lord. Glory to God. I love what I feel in this place. Won't you turn to two or three people just before you're seated and say, get ready for your breakthrough. Get ready for your breakthrough. Get ready for your breakthrough. Hallelujah. Happy November. It's Thanksgiving month, and we've got so much to be thankful for. Hey, welcome to The Lift. So glad you're joining us today. Everyone joining us online, so glad that you've tuned in. I said this in the first service. Sometimes I think it may go unnoticed, but you guys know as a church family, we've got extended family all around the world. We literally have hundreds that join us, maybe even thousands that join us uh, on a monthly basis. They tune into these services, the archives, the podcast, all the media reach. And all of that's really made possible because of your generosity. And uh, it's just amazing what God's doing in and through this house. So can we make some noise for our extended family that joins us week after week? We love you all. So glad you're tuning in. I want to ask real fast, do we have any first-time guests in the room? Any first-time guests if you would just wave? All right, Lift Church family. Put your hands together for our first-time guests. So glad you all are joining us today. If you're joining us for the first time online, welcome. So glad you've tuned in as well. Take a minute. If you're here in person, check the seat back there in front of you, or you can scan the QR code that's up on the screen. Uh, if you're joining us online, there's a link as well. What this is going to allow us to do is connect with one another. Our pastors say all the time, it's really a core value of theirs and, and one of this house. That is the kingdom of God operates on relationships. So we want to connect with you. We just want to lock arms with you as you become all that God has called you to become. And something I really love, I especially love this because I, I've seen it firsthand, the power of it. Everyone that fills out one of these cards as a church, we take time and pray over you by name. And I'm telling you, when the Lift Church prays about something, things change. You're part of a praying house, and things change whenever the people of God pray. So we would love to connect with you. Just be our honor to join you on this race. I told him in the first service, I got a prophetic word, man. You ready for this? November 11th, the bacon's back. Oh, hallelujah. I see people about to run down the aisles, run across the chairs. Men's breakfast, make sure, make sure you get signed up. You can sign up out in the foyer. You'll learn more on the app or on the website. It's a wonderful time of fellowship. And I just have a feeling yet again that the ladies are about to outdo us, men. November 17th, ladies, you all got your next gathering. Every time, every time, man, we got to learn our lesson. November 17th, you guys have a ladies' Christmas party. It's going to be a wonderful time. You can find out more at the information booth. And uh, make sure you sign up for that. November 19th, I'm super excited about this. We have our next baptism service. And, you know, we have seen through the years, we have seen some amazing things in these baptism services. We've seen people heal, deliver, all kinds of amazing stuff. So this is for those who uh, maybe you've just come to Christ, you've come back to the Lord, and you're wanting to make this public declaration. Also, we believe that at times it's, it's appropriate. Not, maybe not every baptism, but we believe there are certain junctures in, in your journey, in your life with the Lord, where you know you're stepping into a new season. It's a new era for you. And you just feel like the appropriate thing to do to signify your fresh commitment to the Lord as you're taking new territory is to go under the waters of baptism again and come, come back up as that public statement. If you feel led to, to do that, make sure you visit us online or check in the app and, and get signed up for that. You can learn all those details and someone will be in touch with you about that coming up November 19th. And one more thing, this is a good news, bad news situation. Tap your neighbor and say, I got good news. Now tap your second pick, the one you didn't choose the first time, and say, I got bad news. 
We've got November 22nd. We've got our Thanks Gathering coming up, our annual good news, bad news situation. The good news is this is always such a wonderful event. The bad news is, y'all, it's, it's really not bad news, but we have just outgrown this facility. Can we give God praise? Though it's uncomfortable, we've outgrown this facility. So what that means is our Thanks Gathering event was announced for like a total of one week, and it got completely filled up. Packed in here like sardines. I mean, so we're making as we're as co accommodating as much as we can, but we really need more space. So, uh, if you didn't sign up, you know, it, 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 you snooze, you lose. So next year, make sure you sign up quicker. <laughs> I'm teasing. I just got the gift of encouragement. I'm trying to encourage you up here this morning. Make sure whenever these events come out, sign up as quick as you can because we hate doing events without you. We want to make sure you're involved. But then the second reason I mention that is because uh, we need someone to just go ahead and write that $5 million, $10 million check so we can get our larger facility so we never, come on. Is there anybody that's got faith in the room this morning for that? So set your faith. Let's set our faith a fresh initiative to just pray every single day as our pastors have instructed us and encouraged us to do that God would lead us into our next facility, a facility that can facilitate the vision God has given them. Well, it's an exciting day here at the Lift. We've got a lot of stuff jam-packed into this day that is going to encourage you and bless you. And to kick that off, we've got Pastor Carla Coggins coming. Will you put your hands together as she comes to the stage? Amen, amen. Happy Sunday, everyone. And today, we are so excited because today we get to celebrate Pastor Appreciation Sunday. Yay. We're going to honor Pastor Keith and Pastor Margie as the shepherds of this house and just let them know how thankful we are for them, how much we love them, and how much we appreciate them. Amen. You know, Pastor Keith has always, I've heard him say this um, for years now. He's always said anything and everything that we get to do for the Lord, it's never a duty, but it is always a delight. Anything that we get to do for the Lord. And, and I have seen Pastor Keith and Pastor Margie live this statement out through the years, time and time again, in the blood, the sweat, the tears, the toil of um, just of ministry in general, and then watching them plant the lift church and see all of the things that God has made happen. They have never seen it as a duty, but to them, I'm going to cry, sorry. It's always been a delight, and it's been my joy to get to see that modeled in their lives. So um, so we're just honored to, to honor them this morning, to tell them how much we love them. And uh, we sent out a message, and we asked our covenant members to give us one word that they best, that, that they thought best described Pastor Keith and Pastor Margie, just one word. And let me tell you, um, people were not happy that I said just one word, okay? <laughs> they were like, just one word? I can't narrow it down. So for those who couldn't narrow it down, they submitted like two or three words and then some wrote paragraphs, and it was wonderful. But here's some of the words that, um, that our congregation thought best described Pastor Keith and Pastor Margie. They said that they are people of wisdom, that they are sincere. Uh, multiple times people said uh, that they were faithful and that they are pioneers. Multiple times um, it was said that they were people, when they thought of Pastor Keith and Pastor Margie, they thought of the word integrity. And I can say that that is absolutely true. Who they are that you see on the pulpit up here Wednesdays, Sundays, Mondays for prayer gatherings, that's who they are every day of the week. Um, someone said they're revivalists, and I like that. They're real, they're dedicated, they're consistent, they're honorable, they're anointed, they're loving. They are the total package, someone said. Um, it was said that they are humble, they're transparent, they're intentional, and I like that one. They're intentional about what they do. They're genuine, they're unwavering, they are energetic, they are wise shepherds, and they are servant-hearted. And I think every single one of these words describes Pastor Keith and Pastor Margie. Amen. It speaks of who they are and how well they lead. And I think I can speak on behalf of everyone here when I say that we have the best pastors ever. Amen. 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 We love you guys. Yeah. Let's stand. Give them a hand clap. We love you guys. 
We do have a small token of appreciation, just a way to say thank you for who you are and what you do for us. Just as a house, we love you guys. Um, so we got Pastor Margie some red roses. Those are her favorites. And a gift card to their favorite restaurant. So we spoke both of their love languages this morning, right? Pastor Margie loves gifts. Pastor Keith loves words of affirmation. So we got all the bases covered this morning. <laughs> so we do love you guys. We're so thankful for all that you do. And another, yeah, give them another hand clap. We love it. We love it. We love you guys. You may be seated just for one moment. Another way um, that we are going to honor them this morning and just show them a way to show them how much we appreciate them is that we are going to receive a special offering as a house that is going to go directly to Pastor Keith and Pastor Margie. You know, Jeremiah 3, 15 says, And I will give you shepherds according to my heart, who will feed you with knowledge and with understanding. 1 Timothy 5 says, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and in doctrine. You know, and the Lord has blessed us with pastors who feed us well every week. Amen. They labor in the word. They labor in doctrine. And you know, and they, they stretch us. Man, sometimes they preach and I'm like, mm, I didn't really want to hear that today, but that's all right. <laughs> they stretch us. They encourage us. They love us. They, they push us, you know, to, to be all that God has called us to be. And so today we just want to honor them. And as a way to show them thank you, we are going to receive a special offering. Um, anything that is not designated as tithe or building for the future or uh, missions, anything like that, will go directly to Pastor Keith and Pastor Margie. If you would like to give online or by text, you can do that and just select Pastor's Offering whenever you do that, and we'll make sure that it all goes to them. And so if you would stand with me, we're going to pray for Pastor Keith and Pastor Margie this morning, and then you may uh, come and give your offerings, and, um, and then the team's going to continue to lead us. Father, we thank you so much for this day. Lord, we thank you for your presence that is, Lord, that is just so tangible and so sweet that is already here in the house this morning. And Father, we take this time to just worship you, to say thank you, God, for who you are. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. And Lord, right now, we pray a special prayer for Pastor Keith and Pastor Margie. And God, we just pray, Lord, that this year, Lord, that you would take them to the next level in every area of their life. God, we pray that they would walk into the next level of wisdom and discernment that you have for them. God, we pray that they would walk into the next level of anointing that you have for them. God, we pray that they would walk into the next level of favor um, as they go about their days and as they're leading the Lift Church. God, we pray that you would continue to pour out your wisdom on them. God, that they would walk in the path that you have before them. And Lord, we thank you for them. God, we pray that you would bless them. Lord, bless their family abundantly above anything that they could ask or think or imagine. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You're welcome to bring your gifts this morning. So good 
the goodness of God. Yes, I will. I will see of the goodness of God. Go ahead and lift your voice and say, I will see of, of the, the goodness, goodness of God. God. Why don't you lift your hands and just give him a wave offering of praise. Come on, thank the Lord for his goodness, for his mercy. Hallelujah, Jesus, we give you praise. We give you thanks. We magnify your name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. Well, it's good to see you today. How many glad to be seen today? Look at your neighbor and say, you've done it again. You look better than you did last week. Come on, just tell somebody. You might be the lighting in here, but you're just looking great. You're just looking really good. Amen. We love you. You may be seated this morning. We, I just want to say thank you. Margie and I want to express our thanks for all of the gifts and the kind words. I told Margie, I leaned over and said, boy, I'd like to, I want to meet those people. <laughs> Hallelujah. And we can use those kind words to fight the devil next time he tries to fight, right? We just say, now listen, devil. Hallelujah. Here's what some of our friends said, and we're going to believe our friends. Amen. But uh, we are just so blessed and honored to do this journey with you. And I mean that. I'm going to look at each of you, if I can, in the eye and say, we consider it a great honor to be able to walk this road, do this journey with you. God told us to plant a church 10 years ago, and, and when he refused to be talked out of it, I couldn't see what he knew. I couldn't see that you would be part of this plan and part of this journey and part of this church. And and so God has blessed us exceeding abundantly above all we could have asked or think. And I think the best is yet to come. Amen. Hallelujah. And, and so thank you. I, I would be remiss if I didn't take a moment to remind you my favorite John Maxwell quote is this. It takes teamwork to make the dream work. And it is always true. One is too small a number to accomplish anything great. And so we are thankful for all of you. And I want to take a moment and just say that we are thankful for our pastoral team that we set in place about a year and a half ago. Can we give, if you're in the room, all of our pastoral team members, will you stand? And, and we're just so thankful for you and those who aren't in the room. Thank you. Thank you very much. Praise God. Thank you for walking this journey with us into all our leadership team and to everyone who serves in any and every capacity. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Together, we're plundering hell and populating heaven. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. And, and it's just amazing. The Lord has blessed us richly. And I often stop and think and realize and remember and pause and give God thanks for the blessings in my life. How many, how many are developing a good habit of giving God thanks for the blessings in your life? One of the blessings in our life is that Margie and I aren't just a duo. Uh, we're a trio. Because Isabella is right with us and uh, laboring with us and praise God. So we are thankful for Isabella and so thankful for connections. I'm thankful that the Lord allowed us to connect with Bishop Tony Miller. And through Bishop Tony, he's allowed us to have many friends. Bishop Tony used to say that one of his greatest joys was introducing his friends to one another. And uh, we've been so blessed to be part of Destiny Fellowship. And today we are blessed because we have some dear friends with us, Pastors Chuck and Karen Pelham, who are part of not only the leadership of Destiny Fellowship, but they were part of Bishop Tony and Pastor Kathy's life for a number of years. 
And when Bishop Tony and Pastor Kathleen, they planted a church called New Harvest Church in Clewiston, Florida. Miraculous how it began and, and the things God has done. And when they, the Lord was transitioning Bishop and, and Kathy to another phase of ministry as they prayed and looked around and said, Lord, who will we pass this baton to? Who will, who will take our baby to the next level? And, and in prayer, they knew it would be this son and daughter who were, uh, Bishop was blessed with many spiritual sons and daughters, but it was to this son and daughter that they passed New Harvest Church on to. And in the years since, it has continued to grow and flourish. And, and Pastor Chuck and Karen launched a, a Christian school that is flourishing. We've been there and toured it, and they having to keep adding and make it. There's such a powerful footprint for the kingdom of God in that county, in that region, because of the work that's being carried on there. It's a place of expressive worship a place of a prophetic flow, and we are blessed today to have this couple with us. Margie and I have come to love them not only for their gifting, but we love them for the, their grounding. They are, they are the real deal. They, are, they carry a depth about them. And I believe when they pray and speak the name of Jesus, heaven pays attention. And hell pays attention. And things shift in the atmosphere. We've been blessed to have Pastor Chuck here. But for a Destiny Fellowship leadership one day only. And this is our first time to be able to hear this man of God as a local church. So we are honored today. Would you give a great big 11 o'clock service welcome to Pastors Chuck and Karen Pellin as he comes to minister. Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. Good morning, everyone. So good to see you. Why don't you just remain standing for one more second, and uh, let me just say this to you today. Uh, I said it in the first service, but what a tremendous honor and privilege it is for Karen and I to be here today, not just with the Lyft family and to see all that God is doing here, but on this momentous occasion today where you get to honor your pastors and uh, uh, Karen and I have grown to love them over the years, even as Pastor Keith has just mentioned. And uh, I'll tell you this story real quick. Um, Bishop Miller, uh, Karen and I have been in a relationship with him and Pastor Kathy for, for over 30 years before he passed away. And uh, I traveled the world with him, and we were just really close, so, so connected. And um, I don't know, maybe eight or nine years ago, whenever it was, he, um, he called me one day on the phone. He was already, uh, I think he was in Oklahoma at that time. And he said, he said, hey, Chuck, have you met a guy by the name of Keith Nix? And I said, no, sir, I don't know who he is. He said, well, he's up there where, you're, where Karen, Karen has family up here in Sevierville. Her, her dad was raised here. Her grandpa and grandpa, uh, grandma are from this area. So he said, y'all are up there all the time. You don't know this guy by the name of Keith Nix? I said, no, sir, I don't know. He says, well, don't ever go through Sevierville again and not meet him. He said, he and his wife, Marjorie, are the real deal. And he says, I'm telling you, you're going to be blessed just to know them. And it was maybe a couple years later, we, we met each other. And I just want to be honest with you today, uh, probably of all the people in the world that they know and anybody they could have here today, I mean, they've got connections everywhere. And, and what an honor it is today to stand here in this pulpit today and help you honor a gift, not only to this house, but to the kingdom of God, to the body of Christ. So one more time, will you give honor to whom honor is due today? We love you guys. We love you. We love you so much. We love you. And, uh, man, our life is better because of you guys. And, man, I just, uh, I felt this in the first service, and I didn't say it, but you guys are a voice to this territory. You're a, region, you're a regional voice to this territory. And, and um, I know Pastor Caleb had mentioned it a while ago about new spaces, new buildings, and expansion. 
I think it's closer than what you think. It's closer than what you think. And I don't say that just because it feels good. I say that because I really feel that behind the scenes, God is up to something. God's up to something. Because your voice cannot be muzzled. And I'm talking about both of y'all. Both of y'all have a voice in the body of Christ. And this region is crying out for a voice. It's crying out for a sound. It's looking for a sound that reverberate all throughout this region. And I just, I, will you just help me? Let's just release that over them in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you today for our pastors. Lord, we thank you for Pastor Keith and Pastor Marjorie. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that... Lord, you've raised them up in the kingdom of God for such a time as this. And, Father, you're going to use them. Lord, there, there's gifts, there's talents, there's anointings that are only inside of them. But, Lord, they have a word that they carry. They carry a word, an in-season word for this generation. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, and we give you praise for them. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing through them, their family, Lord, Isabella. Lord, we just give you praise, and we give you glory. Come on, somebody shout this. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Well, don't sit down yet. Let's just stand up for a while. It's, no, I'm just kidding. Grab your Bibles. Let's just do that. Let's grab our Bibles this morning. And uh, I, it's kind of my custom. I know you don't have to do it. It's, uh, it's just my custom. I like to stand and read the Bible. It seems like we're living in a culture where everybody's taking a stand for something. I just want to take a stand for God's Word. You know, so I just, it's kind of my custom. Again, it's not a, don't have to do it to be spiritual. It's just my thing, but I just like to give attention to it. Did I tell you where to turn? Ain't nobody discerning in here this morning. No discernment. Second Kings, maybe it's on the, you guys will probably help me. Second Kings chapter three. Oh my goodness. Well, praise the Lord. Man, I am so happy to be here today. Happy to have my wife with me today. We've been married for 39 years. Yeah, got married when we were 12, yes, so we just spend every day in honeymoon. Now, y'all know that's a lie, y'all know that ain't right. <laughs> no, I'm so honored, man. I actually married my best friend, so uh, I tell guys all the time, don't marry anybody that ain't your best friend. If, if they're not going to be your best friend, don't marry them. It's, it, you're going to have a hard time in life. <laughs> Anyway, this ain't about marriage today. <laughs> so, 2 Kings, 2 Kings. Did I tell you where to turn? 2 Kings chapter 3, verse number 5. And do a little bit of scripture reading this morning, then we're going to jump into it. But when Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel, and the king and king Jehoram went out of Samaria at that time, and he mustered all of Israel. Then he went and he, he, went and he sent word to Jehoshaphat, who was the king of Judah, saying, the king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me to fight against Moab? And he said, I will go up. I am as you are, my people as your people, and my horses as your horses. And he said, which way shall we go up? And he answered, this is very important, and he said, by the way of the wilderness. Somebody shout, the wilderness. So the king of Israel went with the king of Judah and the king of Edom, and they made a circuit of seven days' journey, and there was no water. For the, ar for the army or for the cattle that followed them. And then the king of Israel said, Alas, for the Lord has called these three kings to give them into the hand of Moab. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not a prophet of the Lord here? Now, the way I just like to read that, I, it, it, is there not a voice in the land that sounds like God? Is there not somebody in our territory that looks or sounds like God? Is there not a voice powerful enough to deal with our enemies? There's not some voice in the land that we may inquire of the Lord by him. And one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, Pastor Keith is here. <laughs> is that any child's translation? Um, okay. Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here, who used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. Now Elisha, the king of Israel, uh, Elisha said to the king of Israel, What do I have to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father and your mother, which is Ahab and Jezebel, and to the king of Israel and, sit, and, sit, and said to them, No, for the Lord has called these three kings together to give them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, were it not that I regard 
the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. I would not even look at you nor see you. Oh, boy, he was ticked off. He was upset. He was, don't ever get a prophet mad. That prophet was mad. He said, I wouldn't even look at none of y'all if it weren't for the regard of Jehoshaphat being here. <laughs> we used to say in school, I didn't study none of y'all. I didn't study none of y'all. Okay, all right, just dated myself. But this is but a slight thing. Where are we at? Did, did I, let, let, me, let me go back up. Let, I don't want to get too far out of my reading of my text here. And Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, said, I will not look at you nor see you. But bring me now a minstrel or a musician. And it came about when the minstrel played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, thus saith the Lord, make this valley full of trenches. One translation says ditches. For thus saith the Lord, you shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain, yet the valley shall be filled with water. I like to say it this way, the valley is going to be filled with the moving of the Holy Ghost. And you shall drink. Woo, somebody going to get drunk in the Holy Ghost, both you and your cattle and your beast. And this is but a slight thing, a simple thing or a light thing in the sight of the Lord. And he will give the Moabites into your hand. And then he begins to prophesy. Then you shall strike every fortified city, every choice city, fell every good tree, stop the springs of water up, and mar every good piece of land with stones. And there's some significant meanings to that. I don't think we'll get to it, but I, if we had time, we could just hash that out. But it happened in the morning about the time of the offering, the sacrifice, that behold, water came by the way of the wilderness, by the way of Edom. And the country was filled with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now all the Moabites heard that the kings had come up to fight against them, and all who were and, and, and all who were able to put on armor, and the elders were, and the older were summoned and stood on the border, and they arose early in the morning. Very significant here. They rose early in the morning, and the sun was shining or shone on the water, and the Moabites saw the water opposite them as red as blood, and they said, "This is blood," and the kings have surely fought together, and they have turned on one another, slain one another. Now, therefore, Moab to the spoil. But when they came to the camp of Israel, let me just say it the way I feel it. When they came to the Lift Church, <laughs> Ooh, when they came to the Lift Church, the Lift Church rose up, struck the Moabites, struck their enemies, and they fled before them, and they went forward. Somebody shout, go forward. They went forward into the land, slaughtering their enemies, slaughtering the Moabites, slaughtering the Moabites. So this morning, I want to talk to you about, it's a prophetic word. I really felt so impressed to say this to you today. My notes are choppy today because I put them together last night and early this morning, but I just was trying to flow prophetically what I felt like God was saying over this house for such a time as this. So my title this morning is, The Battle is Turning. The Battle is Turning. Just push on about three people and tell them the battle is turning. Come on. Tell them the battle is turning. The battle is turning. Now, I've got, I, that, this is the way kind of God uses me, so I put a lot, like a little subtitle to it. My subtitle is, It's an Ambush. It's an ambush. Now push on somebody else that you don't even know if you like them or not and tell them it's an ambush. Come on, just tell them. It's an ambush. It's an ambush. It's an ambush. I'm going to pray for you. Father, this morning we thank you for the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I thank you for those that have gathered in this room today and those that are watching by the way of social media. Father, this morning we thank you. Holy Spirit, you are the preacher and the teacher. You're the, you're the revealer. You're the revelator of all truth. Lord, I thank you today for what you're going to do in this house. Thank you today for what you're going to do in people's lives. And Holy Spirit, we just give you praise and glory and honor right now that every battle is turning now. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody together said amen, amen, and amen. God bless you this morning. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to take a few moments as I did in the first service and kind of walk back a little bit and give you a little bit of a, of a, of a maybe of a theological background to get to where we need to be just so that hopefully it will make sense to you this morning. I find out that it's interesting that whenever you look at the nature of God or, or you begin to study about the nature of God, one of the attributes about his nature is that you'll find out that God is immutable. Uh, meaning this, that immutable means literally that God is absolute. God is undisputable. He is undeniable. God is a permanent thing. God is a permanent fixture. He's fixed. He's unchanging. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 8, that 
He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So God is a God that does not change. This will be on the screen for you if you're taking notes. God is consistently consistent. He's consistently consistent. If he was a way maker, he is a way maker, and he will always be a way maker. He is consistently consistent. And not only is God immutable, but here's what I like about one of the characteristics that defines his nature. Not only is God immutable, but God is unpredictable. And even though you can't, you can't find any inconsistencies with his character, there's always unpredictability in his activity. In other words, God will just make it work no matter how you think it should or should not work, but God will always show up out on time and begin to turn things around just for you because he, he's immutable, changes not, but he's also unpredictable in how he does a thing. Push on somebody and tell them God will do anything that he needs to do for you. Just tell them he'll do anything. And you, you, can, you, you can predict who he will always be, but you can't always predict how he will do it. He's immutable and he's unpredictable all at the same time. And just when you didn't think that there was any way left for God to do something or for God to turn something or God to fix something, he begins to show up and he makes a way out of no way. In fact, what God does, he takes what the devil meant for harm and he turns it around and he brings some good up out of it because he's unpredictable in his activity and he's always changing not. Hallelujah. Woo, I feel like preaching here in a minute. So, so, so in order for all this to take place, you got to combine all these scriptures and these thoughts together. So in order for all this to take place, how many believe that God is sovereign? So in order for God to be sovereign, that means that whatever he creates, he has authority or power to manage it. Whatever God has created, he has power over it. If God doesn't have power over what he creates, then he's probably not a sovereign God. But if God has created something, then he has authority to govern it. He has power to manage it. Here's a couple of scriptures for you. Hebrews 1.3 says, He upholds all things, somebody shout all things, by the word of his power. Colossians 1.17 says, In him all things, somebody shout all things, in him all things are held together. Now, we know this in Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So if all things come from him, then all things depend on him for their continual existence. So if God were to cease to exist, then everything would cease to exist because everything is predicated on him. All things are held together by him and for him. So if God didn't exist, then nothing would exist. But the fact that everything exists as we know it then God, we know, exists, and if God created it, then we know that he has power to manage it. So John 1, 3 says it this way, all things, somebody shout all things, all things were created by him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. Now, that's in your Bible. So there's nothing in the created order of things or life in itself that exists outside the boundaries of his sovereignty. He's the creator and the sustainer of everything. I like to say it this way. He rules and reigns over it all. Some people think the devil's in charge. I just want to tell you the devil, he, he may have been let loose, but he ain't in charge of nothing. So, so whenever there is a resistance or, or, or we, we come into a resistance, either God allows it for his purposes or he overcomes that resistance for his purposes. Now, just a few more scriptures. Psalms 24 says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Psalms 115 says, the highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. Meaning this, God has not created anything and turned it over to the devil. There's nothing in the created order of God that God has created. Now, we just define what God has done. He's created everything. So there's nothing that exists apart from him everything was created by him and for him so nothing exists in the created order or in life that exists apart from God so if God created it now he has power and authority over it to manage it that means the devil don't win I just hope y'all know that the devil don't win he will not win he has never won and he never will win 
And don't ever think that he's ever going to get saved one day and make things better. The devil is forever lost. So the devil's not going to make a comeback. This is just the best he's ever had. <laughs> so God has never created anything and turned it over to the devil. In fact, when Jesus comes along in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 12, he says, if I cast this spirit out, this demonic spirit out of this man that's been possessed, that's been ruled and possessed by another spirit. If I cast this spirit out, then you're going to know that the kingdom of God has arrived. In other words, if I cast this spirit out, you're going to know that there's a new sheriff in town. <laughs> If I cast this spirit out, you're going to know there's a new authority in town right now because there's nothing in the creative order that he don't have power over. In fact, I think I said it in the first service. Uh, when Lucifer was in heaven, in all of his glory, all of his splendor, if you want to put it in those terms, when he was like the, 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 the archangel, the, one of the most powerful angels in heaven, he was the worship leader in heaven. You wonder why we got so much perverted music down here because Satan always perverts what God creates. Uh, so, 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 but when he was in all of his authority, all of his splendor in heaven, and when he, when, when, when he tried to lead a rebellion against God in heaven, he tried to lead a rebellion. He got one-third of the angels to come against God. But how many know that he, wouldn't, he didn't lead that rebellion and was successful at it? He led that rebellion and he failed at it because he was kicked out of heaven. And now I just want to say this to you. What makes you think if Satan himself was kicked out of heaven with Jesus in it, what makes you think, what makes you think he's going to have power over the earth with his church in it? It ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. I know, I, know you've been, I've been, I know you've been watching the news. I know you've been watching Fox, MSNBC, whatever your news channels are. I know you've been watching the news. But I want to tell you something. Don't get, don't get your theology from the news. Because God is more powerful than your news station. God is more powerful than your cable station. And what God has started, he's going to finish. God's going to finish what he began. And, it, and the fact that he is a sovereign God, he's the sovereign monarch of the universe. So whatever God has created, he has authority over it to manage it. So he's just not the devil. He's God's devil. Ugh. He's God's devil. I like to put it this way. He's, he's like, I, I've been raised around dogs my whole life back in South Florida. That's where we're from. We're in the swamps and alligators and all that kind of good stuff. So we had hog dogs. And, and, and the devil's like, a, like an old vicious hog dog. He, he, just, he, just, he, he just runs to the end of his chain and he, rah, 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 and then God just snatches him back. That's about the authority that the devil has over the believer. Y'all ain't going to help me in here, but I'm going to preach in a minute. We need to quit giving the devil authority. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. If Jesus has all authority, how much authority can the devil have? So God is, what God is doing in this hour is he's raising up a body of believers in churches all over the world, and particularly in America. God is raising up uh, churches in America that begin to understand, I'm not just making it through life, but I am excelling through life because the kingdom of heaven has come, and every power, every principality, every demonic force is subject to the name that's above every other name and a power that's above every other power. Push on somebody and tell them it's going to turn in a minute now. Just tell them it's going to turn. It's going to turn. I'm going to get to where I'm going. Hang out with me. I'm going to preach in a minute. There's nothing in the created order. So, so even when you feel like you're out of time, or maybe you feel like there have been times when you've missed your time or, or messed up your time or mismanaged your time, the Bible says in Joel chapter 2 that God redeems the time, that God makes up the years that the canker worm and the gnawing uh, locusts and the crawling locusts came to destroy. God begins to make up those years, and that word make it up to you literally means to restore it, to bring completion, and to finish what was started in the first place. And so even when you feel like you have blown your time, missed your time, God begins to make up the time. He begins to make up the years. You have may have missed ten opportunities, but God will be so good to you, he'll give you one opportunity that will be better than the ten that you miss because when God begins to breathe on you, he begins to make up the time that the devil been messing with you in the first place. Tell somebody it's going to turn now. It's going to turn. It's going to turn. Because if he's a created God, and he is a created God, that, that I mean, if, he, if God has created everything, then everything is under his subjection. Everything is subject to his rulership. Now, let me just fix this a little bit. 
God does not live in time. God lives in eternity. We live in time. So since God doesn't live in time, God is never bound by time because he lives in eternity. C.S. Lewis, that great theologian, put it the best in his book, Mere Christianity. He said this about God and time. He said, all the days are now for him. He does not remember you doing things yesterday. He simply sees you doing them. And because, because though you have lost yesterday, he has not. In other words, God has access to every moment of your life from the beginning of your life to the end of your life as though it was present. There's not a past, present, or future in God. Everything to God is present. Everything to God is now. God lives in eternity, but he created time, which is a created order. So the fact that God created time, he's never going to be bound by time. So that means God can walk back into your situation, your dilemma, where the times that you missed it, where the times that you blew it, God can walk back into time because he's not bound by time, because he can manage time. <laughs> God can walk back into time, the time that you missed, he can move into time, anytime, because he's the God of time, because he created time. He can move into time, anywhere, at any time, because he's a timeless God. Push on somebody and tell them, that's a bad God right there. That's a bad God. <laughs> now, watch it. I want, I want to qualify it. That means that by the Holy Spirit, we can actually access those times in our past. I'm going to help somebody right here. You can actually access those times in your past when you were hurt, betrayed, fearful, attacked, or felt any other negative emotion. And you can travel back in time with the help of the Holy Spirit and see God, according to Psalms 46, as a very present help in my time of trouble. So God reserves the right to step out of eternity and into time at any given moment and reveal his glory. Is this making any sense? I'm going to get to where I'm going. Therefore, God has always existed. God has always existed in my past, my present, and my future, all three at the same time. God's never not been there. He's never not going to be there. And so God steps out of eternity, and he helps us begin to manage our time. Let me give you a couple of examples. Let's, let's just say you were diagnosed with a sickness. Or disease, and I just like to like roll that over and just like go after the enemy with everything he's got. Let's say you've been diagnosed with cancer. You didn't get diagnosed today or yesterday because diseases are gener genetically, ge generally genetically, passed down from one generation to the next generation in the bloodline. And so when you go and you get diagnosed, the doctors can only treat what you have symptoms of today. But what God can do, because he's not bound by your time, what God can do, God can walk back in time through several generations of your life where that disease was picked up in the bloodline, and God can walk back in time with you with the power of the Holy Spirit and break the curse of that bloodline and stop it now in the name of Jesus so that it don't keep running through your lineage, it don't get pushed down to the next generation. And that's the power of a sovereign God. And so what God is doing in the earth, he's waking up a body of believers who begin to understand, I have authority and I have some power. I was built for this day and I'm built for this hour. So God lets us walk back in time. And you, maybe you're in here, maybe somebody in your family is diagnosed with cancer or whatever, or maybe you were or sickness, some disease. You have to know today, I tell you, I prophesy to you, get bold enough in your faith and say in the name of Jesus, it stops here right now in the name of Jesus. It's not coming through my lineage. It's not being pushed down to the next generation. My kids will not have to suffer with what everybody else suffered in my family. Push on somebody and tell them it's going to turn now. God can fix it. God can turn it. God's immutable. He can do all these things. So I like to say it this way. The purpose 
of the anointing is to uproot demonic seeds that have been put in your bloodline. You ever seen somebody, wait, just like a daddy. <laughs> yeah, just like their mama. <laughs> I see y'all jugging each other out there. It, I mean, uh, and, and sometimes we do that in fun, but and I get all that. But, but sometimes negative behavior gets passed down. And, 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 and I'm just saying, that might be the way of the world because that's the, that's the best the world has to offer. But you got some power, baby. You got some authority up on the inside of you. And, and, and when you begin to manifest who you are in Christ, you begin to speak to those demonic seeds that have been put into that family lineage of yours, and you begin to break it in the name of Jesus so that the next generation has something to stand on more powerful than the previous generation. He's the God that can turn it. Come on, tell them, tell somebody around you, the battle's going to turn. Now the battle is going to turn. I like to say it this way. You have been built for the battle. You've been built for the battle. That's why we as a body of believers, we have to quit normalizing demonic behavior. Stop normalizing and say, well, that's just the way it is. No, don't normalize demonic behavior. Deal with it. That's what Jesus said. He said, if I cast this devil out, I'm going to send a signal to the whole world that there is a more powerful ruling spirit that just has arrived on this planet and everything becomes subjected to it. And that's where God is taking the body of Christ. Now, I, I did something this morning. I, I don't know if it's going to make sense, but I, I couldn't resist it. Because how many know that it's never too late for God? Y'all didn't say that like you had any confidence. Just, say, just look at somebody and say, it's never too late for God. No, shake them real good. Say, it's never too late for God. I thought about this this morning, Pastor Keith. Oh, my Lord, this is so off the cuff. It, it, I hope it makes sense. Nobody cared about Lazarus until he was attacked. Nobody even thought about Lazarus until he died. And then you know the story, you know, his sisters run up out there to Jesus. Hey, our brother is sick. He's like, whatever. <laughs> he didn't say it like that. <laughs> I just offended half the church right there. <laughs> they go, they, they, they go our, our brother Lazarus is sick. Will you come? And Jesus just hung out for a few more days. Like, I'm not moved by what you're worried about. Because <laughs> I have been living in eternity. And I can walk back in time at any given time and fix the time where it's all been going wrong. So he hangs out another few more days, and then the brother dies. And then, of course, he goes, he hears about Lazarus dying. So he goes, and he gets there, and, of course, Mary and Martha, they're all upset. And they said, Lord, if you would have been here, our brother would not have died. But Jesus looks at them, and he says, this sickness, this disease, this trial, this problem, this trauma, it's but for the glory. Y'all going to catch me. It's for the glory of God. Lord, you don't understand. He's been dead for four days. Now he stinketh, King James. He stinks. It don't matter. It don't matter. What, what you're not getting, not you, talking about the, the girls there. What, what you're not getting, I'm eternal. I'm the sovereign monarch of the universe. Time is a created order. I'm not bound by your four days. I'm not upset because of your four days. Because I know how to walk back in time and deal with what you would call a loss. Deal with what you would call a tragedy. I just want to prophesy this over the lift church. I believe the day is going to come when you're going to see incredible signs and wonders and the power of God is going to even hit the dead. You're going to see the dead raised in your generation because God is not finished with what he started. God is an omnipotent, powerful, moving force in the earth. And what the devil is trying to mean for harm, God's going to raise up a body of believers to turn it, to turn it into in the name of Jesus, push on somebody and tell them the battle's turning now. So, 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 let's go back to Lazarus for a minute. People, I, I, I think I wrote the script. It's, it's in John 12 somewhere. Might be off if it is. It's somewhere 
in your Bible. <laughs> I think it's New Testament somewhere. <laughs> it says in John 12, I believe it is, that people came to see. I can't even read my own handwriting. People came to see Lazarus. And the Bible says, and many Jews began to believe in Jesus. What did they see? They saw somebody that was dead. They saw somebody, watch, that was out of time. They saw somebody whose time had run out. But since God is not bound by time, since he's not bound by our situations, God says, don't worry about it. I'll march right back into a four-day dead stinking Lazarus, and I'll deal with what the enemy has messed with. And when he gets raised up, people are going to see the glory. My Lord, if we ever need the glory in our land, we need it this time. We need to see a live church. We need to see a lifted church that understands there's some glory, there's some power, and I'm ready to manifest it. Now watch this. Staying on Lazarus just for a moment. It just got in, it got in me so good. Your situation is never gone beyond the brink of a miracle. God can turn it. It's never too late. And it wasn't too late for Lazarus. Your situation that you're facing right now may look dead. But one word from God. Ooh, not one word from CNN. Not one word. Well, don't help me. Don't throw stones at me. But not one word from Fox. Huh? I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to help. I, you, you, you're going to be messed up if you keep listening to every news organization. God's bigger than the news. I tell you, we got better news. It's called good news. It's the gospel of the kingdom of God. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. So let me just help you with this. So it didn't matter. It didn't matter that Lazarus had been dead for four days, that for four days his heart had stopped beating. It didn't matter that for four days bacteria began to grow, releasing enzymes which began to dissolve the body from the inside, producing gas and bloated organs. It didn't matter that for three days his features were not recognizable. He, his body smelt like rotten meat. It didn't matter that ten minutes after his death, flies began to arrive, laying thousands of eggs in the mouth, the nose, the ears, and the eyes. It didn't matter that those eggs began to hatch and maggots began to feed on the tissue. It didn't matter that the beetles began to feast on the dry skin, 24 hours after his death, it didn't matter that, that for two days the spiders, the mites, and the millipedes ate the bugs who ate the beetles who ate the skin off from Lazarus. It didn't matter because when Jesus walked up on the tomb, he said, Lazarus, it didn't matter. Lazarus, come forth. It didn't matter. It didn't matter because the millipedes had to spit out the bugs and the bugs had to spit out the spiders and the beetles had to spit out the flesh and put him back together because when Jesus said, Lazarus, woo, everything in the, in the world began to shake. Push somebody and tell them that it's never too late. It's never too late. I'm trying to help you. It's never too late. It's never too late. <laughs> it's never finished until it's better. Woo. Never too, man, I felt that this morning. It's never too late over your life. And I'm going to say that over this house. I don't know what you've been going through. I just heard a little bit of Pastor Keith just said, he said, he said I'm telling you, it's, it's a right on word. I had no idea. No, I hadn't talked to anybody. Hadn't talked to Pastor Keith at all. None of this stuff. But I felt like the Lift Church has been going through some stuff as a body, corporate body, not to mention individually. But I'm here to tell you if at any one time I've heard the voice of God over any, a group, any group of people, it's here. And God is saying, I'm going to turn the battle. I'm going to fix the battle for you. And it's never too late. You may have written it off. You may have walked away. But God says, I can walk back into time and become a very present help in your time of need. So I say all this because if we're not careful that many people begin to live within the narrow framework of their own experiences. And they never really understand why certain things happen the way that they do. 
They never understand why persecution happens or why battles plotted against them or the pain of adversity that comes against them. But all of that comes as a calculated assignment against your purpose. And you have to recognize when you signed up for Jesus, <laughs> you signed up in the middle of a war. Because your, 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 your life was being chased by devils. And when you said, I'm about to change teams, you signed up in the middle of a war because the devil was after you and so was Jesus. And if you think this battle is going to get any easier, you better just hold your breath and die right now because that's about the best it's going to get. Because I'm telling you, the battle's going to heat up. The enemy is coming with vengeance. All you got to do is look around our world. We've never lived in such a jacked up society in all of our life. Nobody can remember life being like it is now. I'm just telling you, the enemy is ramping up his, his game. But I want to say something. The church is about to ramp up their game, baby. The church is about to throw their fray. They're about to get into the middle of the fray. And they're going to say, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a shield. But I come to you in the name of the Lord. And see the power of hell broken in the name of Come on, if you believe that, shout yes. If you believe it, shout yes. Amen, amen. All right, if you sit, I want to preach in a minute. Let me get there. So it's a calculated assignment. So the truth is, the truth is we know this, that there is an orchestrated plot against your life that comes to undermine your progress so that it will discredit your authority. And cause you to shrink back from your ultimate purpose and fulfillment of the destiny that God's put on the inside of you. And that's why I feel like this over this house. And I could be wrong. Pastor Keith will fix it up in the next couple of weeks. But <laughs> then he'll write me a letter. You ain't never coming back, son. Don't worry about it. I, I know, whatever. <laughs> but, but I feel like there's been some, some, some assignments against this house. There's been a, a, a diabolical plot of the enemy to bring discouragement over the purpose and the mission of this house. And I feel like the enemy is just trying to work his game and to bring discouragement among God's people. But I came here to tell you, it may look one way right now, but that ain't the way it's going to end, baby. It may look like this, but God will step back in any moment and turn it. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, 39, we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but those who have faith to the preserving of our soul. Look at your neighbor and say, I've got some faith. No, I mean, say it like you're about to bust something up. Say, I've got some faith. I mean, I've got some real, genuine, Bible-believing, devil-stomping, territory-uprooting, demonic-shattering kind of faith. That's the kind of faith I got. I got, I got faith that, that when I lift my voice, I got faith that when I open up my mouth, I've got faith that whenever I begin to declare and decree a thing, heavens begin to shake. The earth begins to shake, and devils don't know what to do. See, the devil should have killed you when he had you, but he messed up. He blew it. But now here you are in 2023 with a voice of authority that's about to wreak havoc in the realm of darkness. That's the power of God. That's the authority of God. So, so let me just hurry because, is it 1230, Pastor Keith? Or do we get out the same day we started? Is that the rule? <laughs> I just saw the clock. My Lord, time flies in Tennessee, don't it? Man, in Florida, we just like, yeah, yeah, we just hanging out, man. You blink your eyes, like, boom, you got to go, son. Many times, because of our past experiences that may have been negative, we tend to believe, if not trained properly, that the battles over our life deals with our past. You think the enemy is fighting you over your past. Never realizing the enemy is not battling you over your yesterdays. He's fighting you over your tomorrows. <laughs> The battle is never over who I was. The battle is over who I'm about to be. <laughs> the battle is not over, uh, it, the battle is never about, the enemy may not ever fear who I am. But he does fear 
who I may become. <laughs> so he's working because the battle is never not over what I did. That's a wasted energy for the enemy. But the battle will always be over what I'm about to do. Will you just push on somebody and tell them, I'm about to turn this thing upside down. Will you just tell them, I'm about to turn it. I'm about to turn this thing upside down. That's why we have to be careful that we don't give the enemy more credit. Many of you know Bishop Tony Miller, been in mine and Karen's life here in Pastor Kathy for like 30 years. I mean, traveled the world with him, been thousands of meetings and venues and seen all kind of things happen. I mean, I mean, I've seen the dead raised twice. So I'm not intimidated by death. Because once you see it, I've seen cancer disappear, tumors disappear, blinded eyes open, cripples get up out of wheelchairs. I've watched arms and limbs grow. I mean, you name it, I've seen it. So I'm not intimidated by the picture. I'm not intimidated by what I see. Now, I'm not saying I don't have some bad days, because sometimes I do, but I'm just saying overall, the, the progression of my faith is never intimidated by the moment or the circumstance. And, and Bishop used to have this saying. I've been with him for so many times. He goes, he goes, everybody makes it out like he's a great big devil, and we got this little bitty God. And he used to say this all the time. I know it's kind of corny, but we loved it. You know, he, he would just go, he goes, he goes some of y'all need to get God out of your hip pocket. And let him get big in your life. And if you ever want to find the devil, just look on the bottom of your shoe because that's where he is. And I don't know why in the world we flip this thing. It's like we put this great big devil out there and we got, we got God in our little bitty hip pocket back here. And I'm just trying to tell you, he's the sovereign monarch of the universe. So whatever he created, he has authority over it. That means he has authority over powers and principalities. So let me say it to you this way because we got to go, I guess. <laughs> Lord of mercy. Adversity is not your enemy. It's just proof that you have one. And it's the process of adversity that shapes the vessel that ultimately becomes the voice. So everything you've been going through, God's preparing you. Become that voice. Now, the Bible says in Psalms 104 that God has set my boundaries that no man should go against them or pass them. Sometimes God allows us to go through certain things and certain trials, not to always to teach us or to help us learn certain things. I believe sometimes God allows us to go through trials so that he can teach the trials. You can only take it so far because God has set my boundaries. So sometimes God lets us go through something so that he can teach the trials. You came against them, but you don't get to take them out. When, when Noah went into the flood, it wasn't so that God could teach Noah about floodwaters. God was teaching the floodwaters, there's just some people that you don't get to drown. <laughs> oh, my Lord. Oh, somebody should have threw a baby right there. That's a baby, that's a baby statement right there. Throwing babies in chairs, books, babies, Bibles, and chairs. That's how we do it around here. So, 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 so when, the, when the Hebrew boys went into the fiery furnace, God wasn't teaching them on, the, on, 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 on fire. He wasn't teaching them about the, the, what fire is like and what fire could do. He was teaching the fire. There's just some people that you don't get to burn up. When Daniel was in the lion's den, he wasn't teaching Daniel about lions. He was teaching people that some days you're going to be thrown into the middle of a lion's den and you're going to be able to look at them lions and say, you, you can't devour everybody. You don't get to eat everybody up. So some of these things that you're going through, it's God teaching the trials. You have no authority over them. And I, I don't, we don't have time to break all this down, but when, when those Hebrew boys were in the fiery furnace, you know, when, 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 when King Neb threw him in there and, and he... You know, the, the flames were so hot that when the guards opened it up, the flames leaked out and jumped on the guards and consumed them, burnt them. And, and so when Nebuchadnezzar looked in there, I guess they had some little way to look inside the furnace. He said, how many did we throw in there? They said, we threw three, king, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He said, well, there's something going on in there that don't make sense because I see one, two, three, four. 
How many did we throw in there? We threw three, King. He said, let me back, let me back it up. Four, three, two, one. No matter how he counted it, there were four in that fiery furnace. And the fourth one appeared to be like the Son of God. Because God's not bound by time. He can move out of eternity and into your time at any time and make it the right time for all time. Oh. And so when he drug them out, when he drug them out, the Bible says, now, I, I was a firefighter in Clouston for, for 14 years. I've been in burning houses, saving people. I, I know what all that's like. And, 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 and when, when, in those, in those uh, fully engulfed buildings or whatever, there's no way, there's no way that you can be in a fire and walk out of that fire and not smell like smoke. No way. That's coming from a professional firefighter. <laughs> I've been in the fire, baby. <laughs> I've been there. And you come out, I mean, Karen would tell you, my clothes, not my fire suit, not, not my oxygen mask, not, not my helmet, my underclothes would smell like smoke. And she'd say, you have to change them outside. Because that smoke would get all up in you. In fact, as a firefighter, it'd get in your pores. And so, 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 but the Bible says when these men came out of the fire, there was not one hair of their hair singed, and not even the smell of smoke was on their bodies. Good God Almighty. I'm just trying to tell you when God turns it, He turns it for all time. Push on somebody, tell them the battle's turning now. The battle's turning. Pastor Keith, I don't take five minutes, Pastor Keith. Is that all right? I don't take five minutes. Just, I, I know we got to go. I, I just saw the clock. It's like, you know what we could do? We could all just fall out. We'll call everybody that left all the way and say, man, the power of God's hit this place. Man, the move of God is happening. We need to move. So, so the battle you're facing is forming your future. Spiritual warfare is more than opposition. It's preparation. God is preparing you for what he's prepared for you. You're being built and conditioned for the long haul. And God is forming you. The greatest battles always break out on the territory you're called to build upon. The reason why the enemy, and I don't know any history or stories, but the reason why I felt like the enemy was attacking this house and the enemy was moving in like, 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 like Israel against Gaza. <laughs> I'm sorry if I just offended y'all. I'm just saying that, that's truth, though. Like, like they were moving in, and they were letting the enemy know, no, you don't get to operate freely and unhindered without a fight. And I'm telling you, when the body of Christ begins to wake up and realize, hey, listen, you came up in here and you trespassing. You are trespassing. It is illegal for you to be in my territory. It's illegal. That's why when you pray for people, I say it all the time, people especially with cancer, it's illegal for cancer to be in your body as a born-again believer. It's trespassing. So, 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 so where you're being attacked is an indication of what you're about ready to acquire. Because the enemy only attacks what he fears the most. And so there's a battle that's been waging, and the call to advance the call to move to next levels always comes through the mouth of an enemy. Always. And you haven't made any progress until for real opposition shows up. But when opposition shows up, you just need to know we're right where we need to be. And we're not going to give in to the opposition. We're going to keep declaring vision. We're going to keep declaring life. People are still going to get saved. People are going to get healed. People are going to get delivered. We're going to cast devils out. We're going to break addictions. We're going to see the glory of God come through Sevier County like we've never seen. The whole region is going to be touched because God is raising up a church in Sevier County that has a voice of authority to release over the land and tell the devil, you had your day, but it's our day now. Come on, if you believe that, shout yes. Shout yes. I got to quit. I better quit, Pastor. Why don't the worship team come? I, I need to quit. I, there's so much more to that. Go back to the first service, and you got more in there. And the first service didn't get what you just got, okay? So just put it all together and make it sense somewhere. 
So let, let's do this. Let's do this because when, 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 when Mesha, the king of Moab, was coming against Jehoram, who was the king of Israel, Jehoram knew that he didn't have the strength to go against Moab. Jehoram's mother and father was Ahab and Jezebel. Anytime you got an Ahab and Jezebel spirit ruling, you got a jacked up situation. And though Ahab and Jezebel has since been gone now, Jehoram is the king. Ahab and Jezebel were the ones who instituted Baal worship. That's where we get all this sacrificing of innocent children and all these things that just begin to play out in our society. And when Jehoram came, he broke down the altars of Baal, but he did not stop the worship of Baal. Pastor Keith and I were talking about this in the back. Sometimes you can have a form of godliness, but no power. We don't need a church that has a form of godliness. We need to have a church that's full of power. And so, 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 because the Bible says in verse 2, we didn't read it, but it says, and, and, and Jehoram did more evil in the sight of the Lord than anybody. So he was, he, was, he was really a nasty king. He was a wicked king because he didn't lead Israel into battle properly and lead Israel into facing God. So he's concerned. So he, he gets Jehoshaphat because at that time the kingdom was divided into two different kingdoms. You had the northern and the southern. So Jehoram was over the northern, and Jehoshaphat was over the southern kingdom. And in the southern kingdom, you had Judah. That's why when Elisha gets on the scene, he looks at Jehoram and says, I wouldn't even be here had you not got Jehoshaphat on board. I, would, I wouldn't even deal with you because you really are a wicked, worthless somebody. I mean, that's a, that's a ticked-off prophet right there, man. Woo, I wouldn't even deal with you. But the fact that you got Jehoshaphat here, who's the king of Judah, and Judah means praise, we got a chance. We got a chance. Because what, 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 what Jehoshaphat knew and what Elisha knew, if we're going to defeat these kind of enemies, you got to have a people in the camp that know how to lift up their voice. You got to have a church. Come on, Lift Church. You got to have a people in the territory that know how to give God praise. Psalms said that God is known in Judah. Psalms 22 says God inhabits the praises of his people. So really what Elisha was saying to all these kings, even the king of Edom, he was saying to all these guys, listen, if we're not careful, you're going to be focused on the negativity and the, and the amount of the enemies that's coming against you. All you're doing is looking at Moab. And Moab's been a nasty nation for a long time. It was a problem for Moses, Jephthah, Jehud. I mean, you go all through it. He's been a problem all the way throughout the Old Testament. And Elisha knew that you've been, you're watching your enemies. You're paying attention to your enemies. And what you really need to do is you need to start paying attention to God. You need to turn your eyes back to God. You need to begin to lift your voice. And you need to begin to strike up some worship and some praise. Because it's out of your praise that becomes your testimony that God is about to turn it. It's out of your praise that becomes your testimony that God is about to shift the battle lines. And so that's, that's, so, 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 so that's what Elisha did. Come on, we can stand. We can stand, Pastor Keith. If you stand right there, I'll quit. So, 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 so Je Jehoshaphat does this. He says, get Judah. Judah's gathering around. And Elisha's looking around and says, where's my Hammond B3 organ? <laughs> Pastor Jack, where's my Hammond B3 organ? He's looking at all the musicians. He's saying, hey, the problem with Israel, it's not that we don't have power. It's just that we don't have focus. So we got to get the musicians crunk up. <laughs> that, that's in CP version right there, Chuck Pellin version. And, and, and we got to begin to lift our voice. We don't know how God's going to do it. But we know that God exists outside of time. We know the enemy's coming. We know he's there. We know we can't handle him by ourselves. But if we can get some presence into our situation 
because God inhabits the praises. That word inhabit literally means to set up an ambush. I'm trying to tell you this morning, ladies and gentlemen, that you thought you were about to face some of the biggest battles of your life, but in reality, God was setting up an ambush. God was about to bring your enemy to a place where he would not be able to go. Come on, tell somebody it's an ambush. It's an ambush. So the text don't lend to it, but we, can, we have an imagination. They begin to worship. They begin to praise. Because that's what Jehoshaphat was. He was the king of Judah. Judah knows how to worship. Judah knows how to praise. Judah knows how to get presence into a problem. So they begin to lift their voice. And what we didn't have time to qualify, but that whole time that they had to be digging, they were digging, they were digging in the desert. Digging, 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 digging. And God gave them a word. When the musicians began to play, God began to give Elisha a word. He says, you tell them. You tell them, don't look for the wind and don't look for the rain, but I'm going to fill these ditches with water. Whew. Sevier County is about to be filled with some water. That's about to be an overflow of some water. Water. Come on, somebody shout water. Presence, power. It's about to flow. So those boys have been digging. The Bible says they dug all night. Digging, digging. It don't even say that they completed the job. It just says they dug all night. And then they probably collapsed because they, they didn't have water for seven days. Sometimes you have to fight when you don't feel like it. Sometimes you got to worship when you don't feel like it. I know when Karen was diagnosed with cancer last year, you know what we did? I don't want to say this for everybody. I'm just saying this is how God does us. She came to the house. She said, we're turning everything off. We're not going to watch nothing. We're not going to hear nothing. We're just going to set the atmosphere with praise because we're going to believe God to turn this thing. Now, you don't know how hard that was for me because I like war movies. I like killing. <laughs> and she said, you ain't going to watch no more news. And I, I am a news junkie. I, I, I filter a lot of it, but I watch it. She said, ain't no more news. We ain't putting all that in my house. And this is what she, she, she kind of got in front of my face. She, you know, she, she, she kind of like that. She got up in front of me. She said, and I'm telling you, you're going to do it too. <laughs> and so for seven or eight months, I watched more nothing programs. It's almost like like a marathon of Hallmark channels, what it was. Nothing. But you know what? We were driving an atmosphere because we knew that we had to change the way we were thinking. It was a diagnosis. A diagnosis is not a verdict. It was a diagnosis. A diagnosis gave us some focus to our faith. Oh, so that's where we got to attack. That's where we have to fight. So we began to drive that atmosphere of our home. I mean, for six or seven months, all the way until now, she is totally cancer free in the name of Jesus. It happened. Amen. So they got the, they got the, they got the worship going in the camp of Israel. Jehoshaphat stood there and he says, okay, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a prophetic word. Make this valley full of ditches. I want you to dig. I want you to dig. I want you to dig. I want you to dig all night because God is about to move in ways that you, and don't look to the wind. Don't, 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 don't look to the rain. Don't think it, God's going to fill it the way your conventional mind thinks he should because God is not bound by your time or your own imagination. God will show up the way he needs to show up just to prove to your enemies he's bigger than all your enemies. So we know the story. We read it. They dig. The enemy comes in. The enemy comes in at daylight. They've been digging all night. The enemy comes in at daylight. The sun is breaking up over the mountains and it's shining on because when they got through digging, God filled it. The enemy looks at the ditches that have been dug and they see all this water except to the enemy because of the way the sun was hitting it, the enemy thought it was blood. And, and, and Moab, Mesha, the king of Moab says, hey, look, the Israelites begin to turn on one another. 
they begin to fight and devour one another. So it's Moab to the spoil. So let's just go and raid our enemies. But what they didn't know. Oh, Lord. What they didn't know is that the enemy was running into an ambush. And all of this stuff you've been going through, don't worry about it. It's just going to be an ambush because God's about to turn the battle. God's going to turn it. And what you thought came to defeat you, now you're going to rise up and slay your enemies, and you're going to see the power of God. I want to do this. I got to close. I got to close. I, I want to do this. Pastor Jack, you can help me on whatever song y'all feel led. Pastor Keith, can we close in the, like one more time here? I, only got, I get like 30 closings. I think that's the way they count on them at my church. So, so let's do this. How many are ready for the battle to turn? Throw your hand up high as you can right now. I mean, just like, like you are ready. Now, now look at your neighbor and say, no, I'm like really ready. Just tell them, I'm like really, like, can I ask you the way we would do it in South Florida? How many, how many are fed up with it? How many fed up with it? I mean, like, like I, I ain't going to put up with this no more. I'm just like done with it. That's the attitude you got to have. I mean, you got to get so sick and tired of it that something begins to change in you. Because if it'll change in you, God will change it out here. So you got to get to that place where you're like, man, I am done. I'm done. I've been digging ditches. I've been praying. I've been fasting. I've been, I've been declaring the word of the Lord. I, I've been prophesying. I've been preaching. I've just been doing whatever God has called me to do. I've been praying for my family. I've been praying for my children. I've been digging ditches. I'm praying over my destiny. I'm praying over my future. And the enemy is just attacking and attacking and attacking. And I'm tired. I'm tired of the way it's been. Now I need God. So this is what we're going to do. The worship team's going to just begin to worship just for a moment. High praise, whatever you want. I, probably high praise would be better maybe. A little bit of high praise. And then what I'm going to do, it's so significant. And I have to do it this way because this is the way I was led to do it. At some point here in the next probably 30 or 40 seconds, I'm going to count to three. And I'm going to count it out loud. One, two, three. And if you're ready to break the cycle, of the unending battles that you cannot seem to shake when I count to three I need you to run to this altar and I need you to run here like you've got an attitude that you're about to turn something upside down all right come on we're going to worship just for a second come on here we go you're worthy Jesus because you are worthy of it all So right now, in the name of Jesus, we're about to break it to the battle begins to turn in our favor. So on the count of three, don't hesitate. If you hesitate, stay where you're at. On the count of three, one, two, three. Let's do it. Come on. Come on. Come on, Pastor Jack. Come on. Hey, hey, hey. you 
so father right now in the name of jesus we break every strategy we break every plan we break every scheme we break every lie of the enemy now in the name of jesus we come against his attacks we come against his deception we come against his rule now in the name of jesus and father i declare right now in the name of jesus that on november the 5th right here at the lift church the battle the battle began to turn the battle began to turn the ambush the ambush was put in motion and what the enemy meant for harm god god is about to turn it god's about to turn it god's about to bring some good out of it no weapon no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper and every tongue that rises against you you'll vindicate it for that's your inheritance that's your inheritance in the name of jesus in the name of jesus god we declare victory over the camp we declare victory in the lift church we declare victory in every house in every home in every situation in the name of jesus in the name of jesus come on somebody shout somebody shout 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 say hey hey yeah in the name of jesus in the name above every name a moment God's sealing the deal right there in your heart you feel him you feel him God's just telling you it's gonna be all right it's gonna turn those wayward kids are gonna turn those families are gonna turn Those finances are going to turn. That marriage is going to turn. That one that's struggling with an alternative lifestyle is going to turn. It's going to turn. The battle. The battle is turning. It's turning in your favor. in the name of Jesus that diagnosis is turning it's turning Pastor Marjorie that diagnosis is turning there's too much voice there's too much to do to be labored by a sickness and I release over you now such a movement of God's healing from the top of your head to the soles of your feet and as your days are so shall your strength be and there's an anointing that's rising up to drive it out to drive it out in the name of Jesus it's illegal it's illegal it's trespassing in the name of Jesus touch Touch right there. K. 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 In the name of Jesus. It's turning. It's turning. It's turning. You've been through too much to quit now. You fought too long to walk away now. There's too much at stake to give it up now. The promise, 
The promises of God are yes and amen. They're yours. They're yours. In the name of Jesus. Pastor Keith, I prophesy over you that your measure of influence, not only in this region, but nationally and lo globally, is about to hit an exponential pace, moving at a rate. And I heard the Lord say this. We, you and I, we only talked about a date. I have no idea. But I heard the Lord say, I'm raising him up. I think, Pastor Carla, you said that one of the words that somebody described him was, was, was a revivalist. I heard that. There's been a deep longing in your heart, Pastor Keith, not just to have church, but to have a move of God. Ever since you was old enough to hold a microphone and preach, you've been declaring for moves of God. And I declare over you today, a mighty man of God, that you're going to stand in platforms locally, stand in platforms regionally, stand in platforms nationally and globally because it's been in your heart. And you have stood the test of time and you did not allow your spirit to be contaminated by those who were against you or those who just had negative things to say. But you kept your heart pure and you kept your heart clean. And God says, I have built inside of you a depth of the anointing that not just shapes a church, but it shakes regions. It shakes territories. And God says, I'm raising you up in this hour, man of God. Now is not the time to draw back. And I hear the Lord say, you release everything that's in your heart. Preach like a man sent from another world. Preach like you've been on fire for years. And let the fire of God, let it blow and let it go. And let it burn and let it consume. Because there's a revivalist that's being raised up in this generation that has a voice of authority. So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we release a fresh 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 anointing fresh power fresh movement stirring of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus come on just throw that on your pastors come on just throw it on them throw it throw it the best is yet to come Woo! Fire! 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 Burn! Burn! Burn, man of God! In the name of Jesus! In the name of Jesus! I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, Pastor Keith. We, you haven't said nothing to me. I didn't know anything about even what Caleb was saying, Pastor Caleb was saying about needing to expand, you're needing to grow. I don't know any of that stuff. I don't know anything. But I heard the Lord say, this ain't going to do it. This ain't going to do it. This, this building ain't going to do it. And God says, I am supernaturally aligning everything that you have need of. And I'm going to make a way. I'm going to make a way. Whether you have to build, grow, expand, buy property, whatever. Whatever. But God says, here's, what, here's the word of the Lord. I'm going to give you the resources to birth what's in your heart. What's in your heart. Now I know this by the natural. Y'all do youth camp every year. Done it for 20-something years probably. And God says, I'm about to raise up a generation of young people. And because you've been faithful in the little things, God says, I can give you steward over much. And I, I just, if this don't fit, just say, man, he, he should have did better. I don't know, whatever you need to say, but I'm just saying to you, those youth camps, it's just a seed. 
of what God is about to make nationally happen. And the only way I know how to compare it, I just, it all just happened right here. I didn't come here prepared for all this. The only way I know how to compare it the way it's just being downloaded in me right now is I know for many, many years, Pastor Jensen Franklin did these big youth camps where like eight to 10,000 kids showed up. And God says, that's your venue. That's your venue. Thousands. I don't know how many you have, probably hundreds, but thousands. Thousands are coming. And it's going to be a national venue. And you're going to stand and you're going to declare, you're going to bring the people in. You're going to bring people in that you felt like has something to impart into those kids. Of course, you and Pastor Marjorie are going to be main stage, your staff, your team, everybody's going to have a party. I get all that. But God says, I can entrust you to bring stewardship to something to shape a nation. And God says, I'm using what's been going on now for 20-something years as a seedbed because I'm about to put in a harvest like you have never seen before. And I'm about to raise you up. And I hear the Lord say, just think on thousands now. And I'm going to give you the venue. I'm going to give you the places. I'm going to give you the resources. Money will never be an option. Money will never be an option. Money, I'm, I, I feel that money will never be an option. You will not be limited by finances. You will not be limited by what you don't have. But you're going to be focused on what God has said you could have. And the resources will flow. He's not just provider, but he's the God of provision. He's the God of provision and more than enough. More than enough. Woo, how many can just get in agreement with that right there? More. Amen. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, here's your job. Keep on digging ditches, baby. Keep on digging ditches. When somebody says, what you doing? You say, I'm digging a ditch, baby. I'm just digging ditches. Because what I dig, he'll fill. Whatever I dig, he'll fill. So I'm just digging ditches. I'm digging ditches over my family. I'm digging ditches over my children. I'm digging ditches over my promise. I'm digging ditches over this ministry, over this vision. I'm digging, I'm digging, I'm digging, I'm digging. And when the enemy shows up, it's an ambush. When the enemy shows up, it's an ambush. In Jesus' name. Come on, if you believe it, shout yes. Shout yes. Yeah. Come on. There's a breaking. And it's in our favor. And there's a shifting. It's coming round, it's coming round. In my direction. Oh, oh, oh. Come on, praise him. We say God thank pray. you, Jesus. Come on, somebody just say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Wow. Mm. Since, just since that spirit of revival it resides here, but it's about to break out. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Pastor Chuck, for obeying the Lord. How many want Pastor Chuck and Pastor Karen to come back and be with us? Man, when they can spend a couple days, we need, we need a few nights of that. Amen, amen. I love you. We're going to be dismissed in just a moment, but what a wonderful presence of God in this place. Will you prophesy one more time to your neighbor and say things are turning for you? Things are turning for you. Thank you, Jesus. I, I want to mention just, just one thing. We just came back from D.C. And we'll talk more about it later. I'm still processing all that the Lord did. But I want to say a big thank you for praying for us and the team. About 17 ended up going. And uh, I'm not going to take time now. In the first service, I told them about the significance, a little bit of the significance of the number 17. I'm not going to take time to do that now. But it was a powerful time. And, and the way God ordered our steps I'm still just processing just amazing I'm saying all that to say number one thank you for praying 
and, uh, and we're going we're gonna to do it again. And I just believe we were on assignment. That was the assignment. The Lord said, take the prayers to D.C. And we went and, and we prayed and, and God moved marvelously. So I just want you to be thinking about that. Maybe in the future you'll be part of that as well. It was a powerful, powerful time. We love you again. Thank you. Thank you for all your gifts, your words of encouragement, your cards, all the wonderful things for this Pastor's Appreciation Day. And we appreciate you so much. Good to see you. I'm glad Cody and Charity are here with us today. Amen. We love them. This young couple. Praise God. You guys been married how long? Six. Since June. So not quite six months yet. Hallelujah. Amen. So they're celebrating. We're delighted they're with us. Delighted you're with us. Will you turn around, smile at somebody, and give them the biggest smile you've got? Come on. Hallelujah. We love you. Carla's coming to remind us of something or tell us of something, and then we'll, she'll pronounce the benediction. Amen. Amen. Hasn't this been a powerful Sunday? I know my life has been forever changed by this message, and I'm so, so thankful for that. Um, just a couple of quick reminders. Tomorrow night is our Monday night prayer gathering at 630. Be here for that. Wednesday night at 7 is our refuel service, and our teens and our middles meet in the back. So if you have anyone in that age group, get them here for Wednesday night. And then on your way out today, since it is Pastor's Appreciation, we have cupcakes out there for you guys. So take one, take five, take ten. We'll pack you a box if you want them. So take those. And Pastor's favorite little candies are out there, so make sure to take a handful of those with you as well. And um, we love you guys. We're so glad you are with us today. So go in grace and peace in Jesus' name. Amen.